You can start your stream, Michelle. So, thank you. All righty. Welcome back. Live number three today. <laughs> if this is your first time joining us today, welcome aboard. It's been a crazy day. Um, so this afternoon, I'm being joined by Michelle Island. Yes, you are here for the 3 p.m. show. Uh, I'm being joined by Michelle Allen from Monkey's House Senior Dog Hospice and Sanctuary. Um, I think probably most of the people that watch my page have probably seen discussions with Michelle and I before and are probably familiar with Monkey's House. But uh, Michelle, just in case we've got any new folks, can you give us a little uh, lowdown about Monkey's House, what you are, what you do? Um, hi, and thanks for joining. I'm Michelle Allen, uh, founder, co-founder and executive director of Monkey's House. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We pull dogs with terminal diagnoses from shelters. From there, they get amazing vet care. They get surgery if they need it. Specialists, um, incredible nutrition, incredible nutraceuticals. Um, whatever kind of rehab they need to be as comfortable as they can to be ambulatory if possible. And then fun and love, lots of it. Lots of it. So how many dogs are at Monkey's House right now? Right now at the house, just 18. Only 18 in your but, house. You know, I have said, I've said to you before, numbers don't matter, um, but I can have 30 and have a busy day. Yet yesterday, I'll tell you, I never stopped running. It was, it was insane, crazy, not overwhelming, but working on it, working on it. It's, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, so the longer I do this, the better I get at keeping the quality. And so our dogs get a little bit more cute as time goes by and, you run the risk of everything going, everything going on at one time. So the top, we're this for those who are just joining us for the first time this week. We're doing a, a bit of a deeper dive this week into hospice and palliative care, not just for dogs, but for cats, uh, and not just for seniors. For any animal facing a terminal diagnosis, uh, and you know, kind of how we can help them through the process, things that we can do to support them. But uh, Michelle has been kind enough to help me tackle a tough topic, which is natural death versus euthanasia. And uh, we touched on this a little bit on Monday with Dr. Monica Turen, who is a thanatologist, which is a, a death specialist. Pretty, pretty interesting that you can specialize in that. Um, and we touched on it a little bit, and uh, she said that most people are not even aware that that's an option because we have gotten so, so far over toward thinking that we have to euthanize our pets and we can't go through uh, because none of us ever wants to see them suffer. And trying to figure out that dividing line of where where is that, <laughs> that line between natural death and euthanasia? Um, and I've talked a little bit about uh, clear-cut guidelines and Michelle and I actually had to come up with these clear-cut guidelines uh, way back at the beginning um, when we were working on the, the rules for Monkey's House, how, how a dog qualifies to get into Monkey's House, where they come from um, and what is done for them while they're there. So I went to a conference. I was actually speaking at a veterinary conference and I was kind of hanging around waiting for my sessions to begin. So I went across the hall to a hospice and palliative care talk. And this was all very new because Monkey Cell started in 2015. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, really a lot of people weren't even talking about hospice and palliative care at that point. Um, it just, what it's it's sort of like if we go back a decade nobody was talking about physical therapy um so maybe two decades but things kind of come along slowly in the animal world so this was something that was pretty new so when i saw this topic being discussed i thought well this is great because we're starting monkey's house so i should go see what's going on and uh, get some information and so the doctor was talking about uh natural death versus euthanasia. And I started texting Michelle and I said, Michelle, we have to really look at natural death versus euthanasia. 
And I'm going to let you give what your response was at the time, Michelle. <laughs> I freaked out. I really completely freaked out. And I told you that I respected you. So I was willing to, to learn about this. But after spending a career front, front and center of people dying um, in New Jersey, um, assisted suicide is not legal. So people were, were dying and seeing immense, immense suffering and doing my best to stay calm and give comfort in the face of things that I didn't really understand. Um, I didn't want to do that to dogs. And I didn't, um, nothing triggers me more than someone saying the dog is out in the run, he hasn't eaten in four days, they're waiting for him to die. That triggers me. Um, that's, that really pushes me over the edge. So um, you hooked me up with Dr. Monica. You sent me a lot of articles. We started reading and, and talking about this. And it's changed my perspective tremendously, tremendously. And I'm not going to say it has made my job easier, but it has taken some of the burden of my job off of my shoulders. Um, uh, to, tomorrow is the eighth anniversary of monkey passing. And uh, so that was eight years ago. And I was of the belief that it's better a week too early than a minute too late. Very much fear-based assessment. Um, and that's monkey. So that's monkey. This is, we had him for 17 months. And uh, he was really, they said between a week and a week and a month. And uh, he just, he rocked our world and changed everything for us. Now, now that's a, that dog running around is a dog that was in heart failure. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and, and given, given just a very short time to live. <laughs> yes. And what's really tough is you can see his zest for life, his love of running. And yet, you know, you didn't, you didn't want his cords ripping off of his valves. Um, so it was, it was a quality of life decision that Jeff and I made that we would occasionally let him run for short bursts because um, he didn't seem to have a middle. He didn't seem to have a canter or a, you know, he just did this full out thing. So we would let him, you could see he has got a leash on him. Not that we probably could have caught him. Um, <laughs> it was, it was, he was a young dog to be so incredibly sick. Um, and he's fully, his mind was fully functional. His eyes were functional. Um, you know, it was, this was very tough to, to allow him to live and yet make the, the better decisions to protect his body as long as we could. So we, I, I remember at the time we did a lot of research and for people who are interested, maybe we can find some links, but uh, there are a lot of websites that talk about the natural dying process. What people go through, what the animals go through. And depending on whether you want to get more into the spiritual realm of it or just the facts, ma'am, like what's the physical process that's going on, you can find information on both of those. Um, and we did find, I, we read a lot of both. Um, I remember reading a lot of information about the different sort of planes and stages that they go through. And it can be very helpful. Um, I personally would recommend reading that stuff before you have to. Yes. <laughs> um, so you at this point, so it was pretty scary. Who was the first dog that you experienced a natural death with at Monkey's House um, versus euthanasia? Do you remember? That was Molly. And we have some pictures of her. Molly was with us for just over two years. Molly is the buff co colored Cocker Spaniel there. And in that picture, she's actively having a bleed. She had mammary cancer and she had hemangiosarcoma. And with hemangiosarcoma, they have intermittent episodes of internal bleeding. Um, we would absolutely treat what was wrong. We would give her Chinese herbs to help stop the internal bleeding. And it's not like after two hours, their heart rate becomes a certain number and you know they're out of the woods. If they don't get if they don't get worse, then they're doing okay. It's very difficult to come to grips with that. But it was a plan of care. Um, it was something I could do rather than to say, well, she looks like crap. You know, I hope this is the day that she dies. 
um, when you, you and I talked about this an awful lot, and I stayed very in touch with you during this time. And there is so much you can do for a dog between when they're sick and when they die to improve their quality, to help your coping, to help you stay focused on this rather than just carrying the burden of, did my dog have a good day? Is he still happy to be alive? Is it time to put him down? And I think both you and I are passionate about dogs not suffering, about dogs being kept alive when their body is not up to it. And I encourage people to think about times you've been sick, times you've been injured, times you hurt, times you were at the bottom of the barrel. Is that suffering? Are you glad that you woke up the next day? And kind of come up with what you feel is suffering. So for me, I felt, um, I had one time crushed my pelvis in 17 places and the x-ray machine missed all of them. I was admitted to the hospital with the diagnosis of a bruise. I was 25 years old and couldn't move my legs. And I was trying very hard to get out of that hospital and moved to a place where I could feel heard. The next morning, the orthopedist came in and that night was painful and it was really hell. And I really feel like I was suffering. The next morning, the, the radiologist, the, uh, the orthopedist came in and said, what the heck happened to you? You've got four breaks in your pelvis that can't break. You've got this, you've got that. And he left. And my burden was lifted. There was something wrong with me. I had a diagnosis. He didn't change my pain meds. He didn't help <laughs> me. He didn't do squat. He just came in and threw all this stuff at me. And I, was, I felt validated. I felt heard. And I felt like this was going to get better. And that was something that was very important to me because that night was really, really difficult. It was a long, hard, painful night. And so when I, when I look at the dogs and I see how they're doing, I, I always want to make sure that I'm with them. When, when, when you're on this journey, if you make the commitment that you're trying for natural death, you absolutely positively have to be 100% in. You have to have the support of a veterinarian. You have to say, listen, I can do this every day, but Thursday evenings I have this planned, and that day my sister's going to come over. Um, you have to be very realistic with your veterinarian about your finances. There's so many things that can mess up the best laid plans. The best thing to do is be very honest, be constantly evaluating. And again, you can't have this, this, you can't do something like this without a very good relationship with a veterinarian. The best way to do that is to keep your animal, annual appointments and use the same vet so that they get to know you, so that they get to trust that you're following through on instructions or that you're asking good questions or that you're coming in for the right reasons. That's the best way to start before you say, hey, I know my dog is full of cancer, but I'd like to ride this out. Um, you really need to establish trust. So um, how, how are you, so I, these dogs that are going through the natural death process, I'm assuming at some point they stop eating. But that, um, but that doesn't have to be the end. No, if they stop eating, um, I, look at, I, I look at them, I smell their breath. Um, I look to see why I think they're stop eating. Um, if need be, I run them to the vet for quick blood work. Um, we try appetite stimulants. We try different foods. I put baby food on the tip of their nose and go boop. Um, we, we continue to try. Um, if days go by and anti-nausea meds aren't working and the blood work didn't yield anything specific, um, then we start offering them anything rather than food that's going to help preserve their life. Um, in, a, in a positive way, then we'll try anything. And sometimes anything is enough to get them started eating again, and you can eventually wean the good stuff back into it. But I don't take not eating as a sign that they're ready to go. Okay. Um, and what kind of support do you give them? So you said that uh, the cocker was actively having a bleed when that picture was taken. Um, what kind of support measures do you, because I know, uh, I think we had a picture of ML Bob that went by. He had liver cancer, correct? Yes. Yes. And he was also a natural death, correct? Yes, he was. 
And how about, um, I can't remember that one's the, the kidney failure pit bull. Parker. 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 And he was also a natural death. Yes. No, um, no, you know what? Parker was not. Parker was euthanized. Um, he probably would have died within a few hours, but he became very dry. I mean, this was one of those things I was sleeping with him and um, I started hearing breathing noises and I woke up and I had, I had no idea what was wrong. And I, I literally said, what would Judy do? And you always start no matter what the dog is in with, you always start at their face. You look at their eyes, you look at their nose, you look in their mouth, like you just you just do a full head to toe assessment of the dog. And the first thing I saw was that both of his nose nostrils were clogged with mucus. And I got a humidifier out. I didn't want to drag him into the bathroom to put the um, shower on. He, he wasn't, he, he, he was, he was good where he was. He was just making these noises. And I, I didn't want to, overdue if this wasn't the right thing. Um, I have one of those, I don't know who makes it, Vicks. It's a. It's like a handheld device with a mask on it that helps melt mucus. Um, but you later explained to me that with kidney disease, they, come, they become so dry that what I was seeing was just the tip of the iceberg. He was dry all the way back. Um, and so I was concerned that that was going to start um, breathing problems. And for as far as he was along in the disease, he had stopped walking. Um, we kept him in a wagon in the house and he loves to lay in the sun. So I would move the wagon wherever the sun was coming from, you know, within the house and turning him. So his quality of life um, was decreasing and we were doing all we could to bring quality to him. But at this point, my concern was breathing issues. Um, and we had arranged for um, in-home euthanasia, although we did it outside where he loved to be. Um, and it was a very, it was a very cold morning, and I, the the vet that came out had to wait because we put a mattress out there, we put heating pads out there, um, and I wanted him to. He was wrapped up in blankets, but I wanted him to just feel the sun as he was leaving this world. So I might have sounded like a lunatic, but Parker knew what we were doing, and part it was really, it was really good for Parker. And so these are the kind of decisions that you can make. And it really helps if you have a veterinarian who's understanding and not in a big rush. Um, because you want things to be whatever is best for that particular animal. Mm -hmm. So if that means being outside, great. If that means being in a sunny spot, great. If that means being on your bed, uh, because that's where they're used to sleeping, great. Um, that's you know, if we have to choose euthanasia, but even as, if we're allowing them to go through a natural death process, things like that, getting them places that they like, whether it's the bed, the sun, the going for a walk in the wagon, um, getting, getting things as comfortable as possible for them. And a lot of these dogs will get very cold as things circulation is slowing down. A lot of times they don't have as much muscle mass, no body fat covering by that point. Um, so I would say keeping them warm is really critical. Uh, you know, they can go literally weeks, maybe months without eating. Without water, they go downhill very fast. So fluids are important, but um, food is, is not the critical issue for these animals. So uh, let's, who else has gone through a natural death? So ML Bob, was his a natural death? Yes. Let's talk about ML Bob. So he was a liver failure dog mm -hmm. who hung around for a lot longer than anyone ever thought he would hang around. Yeah. Well, he knew, he knew that the big TV cameras were coming, so he stayed for all that stuff. Um, <laughs> but he came, he had the biggest liver you had ever seen. Um, it's a little beagle. He was all liver. <laughs> little beagle, little beagle, but he looked like he had a banana, like his head, a banana and his tail. That's and, and it just bloated out. And um, he had gone into he was in the shelter and he had gone into quarantine. And his foster mom said, "Listen, he doesn't have long. I really want to give him some ice cream. I really want I really want to do all this stuff for him." And I said, "I know and I understand, but I want to just see if we can help him. I just want to see if we can turn this around." So for right now, we're just going to do all provide and we're just going to do these supplements. And when things start looking bad, you can give them all the ice cream that you want. And I guess by 
maybe uh, within a few months by October, um, he wasn't he wasn't able to walk. He was so full of ascites, um, and I I I didn't. We didn't x-ray, but I just assumed that the cancer had spread somewhere that had stopped him from being able to walk because I was turning him, bathing him. Um, and he'd gone quite a few days. I, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I want to say 10 or 11 days without eating. And I was talking to you and I said, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with this. He never had a dental, so he had, did have mouth pain. He was not for his for as big and brown as his eyes were, he was not the most trusting soul. Um, so he was not pleased when I put eye drops in. He was not pleased when I put coconut oil on his nose. He was not pleased when I used dental drops to clean his mouth. He, he didn't trust that time. And um, so we had talked about euthanasia and I invited um, his, his foster mom over and I said, we've been trying to get him to eat. We can't get him to get anything to eat, but if something calls to you, go ahead and bring it. And she stopped at a fast food chain and brought nuggets, um, chicken nuggets. And I had an internal freak out because I thought if he does eat these, his pancreatitis will be so crazy that he'll be in agony before the vet gets here. So he ate them. Uh, she very kindly agreed to just give him half if I agreed to give him the other half the next day. And um, that night uh, he was in a big round bed and he diuresed several times, I guess, there was so much MSG in this delicious nugget um, that all of his ascites was peed out. And he woke up being able to walk. Um, <laughs> he kind of kind of looked like a miracle. And it was it was crazy. And all I can think of is just, you know, they say water follows salt. So <laughs> And I never thought to give him a bunch of salt. <laughs> it's the chicken nugget cure. <laughs> the chicken nugget miracle actually is what we call it. So um, how, how much longer did he stick around after the chicken nugget miracle? He stuck around for another five months. There you go. Um, but from then go. on, he would not eat anything healthy. And every night we called it Bob's buffet. He would have seven or eight things presented to him and he would pick what he wanted. And I remember one night he ate macaroni and cheese that was to be Jeff and my dinner and uh it, it was from a fast food chain that's local and I I thought how have I sunk this low that I would feed this dog this food this this food and I then thought about what I was saying that was our dinner and I didn't think <laughs> anything that we were eating it but I did uh, but I was disgusted with myself that I was allowing an actively dying dog to eat it um, but uh, so, so his rule was n no healthy food, but we were able to get some supplements into him and we were able to get some great adventures with him. So can you um, talk a little bit about the actual dying process, like in like the last 24 hours, what's going on with these guys? You know, um, when, Molly, when Molly was passing, you were kind of holding my hand through this. Um, we were we were texting back and forth, and I was keeping you up to date. And at that point, when she was actually really truly dying, um, she was lethargic or kind of limp, but still alert. So I could carry her outside and hold her in position, and she would pee outside. Um, but she was she was fading away. She was she was just withdrawing. Her gums were as white as the computer screen. Um, her breathing was sometimes loud and sometimes fast, and then it would settle. And it wouldn't settle by me cooing her or rubbing her ears. It would just settle on its own. Um, she wasn't drinking. And by that time, we were giving her a, between a quarter and a half of the amount of subcutaneous fluids that we normally use to support life. So here we were just trying to prevent dehydration, which feels really nasty, um, to, to just help allow her to pass. Now, this picture of her laying here with Parker, so she's the dog in the blue sweater, and she was actively having a bleed, and I was waiting to see if the medication helped. What you can't see is that um, there was a fireplace in the room, and she was pretty warm in her sweater, but I didn't want to take it off because I didn't want to move her. I didn't want to knock any kind of clotting off that was there. And I had been laying 
with her on the floor for quite a while when suddenly, um, I think there's another picture of a German shepherd there laying with her. So Molly was, there we go. So that's, that's my dog, Sora. And she and Molly lived together, but they were not best buddies. They did not cuddle, they did not lay in bed together. And yet Parker knew and Sora knew. They were laying there with her, comforting her. And none of us want our dogs to die. But if you can embrace that it's happening, there's some tremendously beautiful moments that will bring comfort to you later on down the line. Um, and to see Sora, you know, at first I thought she was trying to crush her. <laughs> and then I realized she was just kind of giving her a hug and telling her it's okay. So um, somebody says you mentioned not being emotional crying while the passing is happening. So they don't feel our emotions and anxieties. How do you go about that? Because I oh. know you, you've you gone through this. How many dogs? A hundred and... 30. So, so, so we've had we've had um, a little over 145 dogs join us. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm just gonna just guess and say 100 and, 115 or 120 times at this point. Um, I am emotional. I, I, I do get emotional. Um, sometimes I try to vent though. So I might say to you, things are not well, and the biggest problem is my freaking human emotions. Um, because I don't want them to stand in the way of something that dogs see as a natural, as a natural event. And I want to respect that. Um, I'm not crying out of control. I'm tears, th th there may just be tears. Um, the crying out of control comes after. There's plenty of time. You have the rest of your life to grieve them. So it's so important that in their final moments, you're as strong as you can be for them during this time so that they aren't worried about you. So they, they aren't feeling like they have to stay um, because there's something very wrong. This is really, a, it's really, um, you know, I always say it's a very beautiful time. Uh, a friend of mine recently lost her dog and she, it wasn't beautiful to her. Her dog died. Um, it was death, it was at home, it was everything she'd wished for her, um, but her dog still died. So I, I wanna be respectful of that. It's it's the end, it's, it's completing a journey well. It's, it's completing a journey well. Well said. Was he the peanut butter pie? Yeah, that was ML Bob. It was ML Bob, it was ML Bob. But I remember when Molly actually passed. Um, so she was our first and I texted you about three o'clock in the morning, which was very common. <laughs> yes. And, and you know what I what I was reading. I had I had done this paper in nursing school about anticipate anticipated grief, and how how if you say all the things you want to say and do all the things you want to do and you're with your loved one in the end, that um, it's not as hard. And I believe what I wrote to you was that it's not true. It's, it's not true. Um, it was it was horribly hard. It was you, you know we had met the criteria. She was breathing really fast and then really slow and then really fast and then she stopped breathing. And I kept waiting for her to start breathing. And then I realized, you know, that she had passed. And it was, I was awake, I was with her. It was what we wanted. It was the goal, it was not what I wanted. Right. And um, I, th I think I said something like, it still hurts like hell. But since then, since going through so many natural deaths, I can tell you that the burden of every single day, my dog is dying. <clears throat> is this a good day? Do they, is their life still worth living to them? I don't ask that question anymore. Um, yes, the dogs are dying. Uh, what, what can I do to make things better for them? Um, some dogs, like we have, we have a dog here right now, Lucille, a beautiful blue pity who just, is a love. She has the cutest little tail wag and this cute, she has like a bouncing booty when she walks. Um, and unfortunately she has a mass in her mouth that we, that we missed, that's very fast growing. And it's the whole roof of her mouth all the way in the back. And since that's been found, she has lumps coming up everywhere. Um, I don't think she'll be a candidate for natural death. I don't want her to lose her airway and have troubles breathing. Um, there's less that we can do in this circumstance. Other circumstances, 
Uh, and that's something I have to really wrap my head around. I do a lot of thinking. I do a lot of reading. I, you know, like we've had other dogs with masses where we use new placing and it's bought them years. As a matter of fact, Violet is still with us. Um, Violet. <laughs> and she's doing amazing. Um, so it's, 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 it's always hard. It's always hard. Coming to grips with the reality of it is very hard. But in the meantime, the best you can do is is the best you can do. So I, I, I try to keep my, my emotions in check. I try to have them in pri private. I share them with my friends. Um, sometimes I just need to go for a walk with no dogs where I have to watch the respirations. Um, but it's important to them. So when so, so if you're taking your dog to be euthanized, you know, you make an appointment, you go in at two o'clock, you sign papers, and very shortly thereafter, you have sharp stabbing pains in your heart and your eyes, and you leave. When you commit to trying to go for a natural assisted death, and I want to be careful with those words, there's the different agencies do not agree on the terms. So it's not like I'm leaving them out in the cold to die. That is not the case. When I'm committing to a committed to a natural assisted death, that is way more work, way less sleep than humane euthanasia. Um, and when people say, oh, I can't afford chemo, or my dog's not good in the car, there's nothing to do now but wait, or, or I guess this is palliative care, I, I want to stop them in their tracks and say, there is so much you can do. There's so much you can do to fight to give this time quality, to maybe extend the quality in their time. And to have- Even without chemo and radiation and surgery and- Right, right. And, and, and we, haven't, we haven't done the chemo here. Um, we haven't done radiation here. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's so much that can be done and, and, and losing your dog because you can't afford treatment is, I, I just can't, I just can't imagine that. We've always pulled the money out of somewhere for our own personal dogs. Um, but having the opportunity to fight, having the opportunity to make sure that they have everything that they want all of the time and that they leave this world with no doubt that they're tremendously loved, it 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 helps it helps on the other side. Like I said, I'm I'm a mess the first day. Sometimes I'm a mess the second day. But I pass through the grieving phase faster, um, and I have less regrets. It's it's very normal when your dog passes to say, "Did I give him the heartworm pill on Tuesday? Why did I give him a bath?" Like 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 insane things that did not directly impact their passing at that time. You question and you revisit over and over. That is a normal part of grieving. That is how you're trying to process all of this. The important thing is that you move through it. If you get stuck, you, you need to ask people, you ask your vet, ask your friends. Um, I found comfort in saving the texts back and forth from you because I would say, oh, they have bloody diarrhea. Oh, it's all over the living room. You know, and you'd say, meet me at the office at eight. You know what I mean? And it would just, you know, I could, I could see the progression instead of just saying, but they were just fine and now they're dead. Um, it, it really helps to document. I, I know that Dr. Monica talked about a journal. I think that's a fabulous idea. Yeah. I don't, do don't just look at that for looking at their quality of life. Tuck that away someday from when you wonder why things happen. Because after a while, you know, in grieving, your mind plays tricks on you and you think, did I do that? Did I, why didn't I take, why didn't I take him to this hospital? Why didn't I try the broccoli diet? And when you go back and revisit, then you'll say, oh, they weren't well enough to try the broccoli diet or that hospital was really far away and they weren't good in the car. You know, there's, there's answers. There are answers there for you that you don't think to ask the questions for at the time. So, <laughs> Janet says, I think the possible pain or suffering with natural death worries most of us. And that is where the active um, natural death, it's not just sitting on the floor crying next to them. You are actively participating in the process and you have to be on top of pain. You have to manage pain. Um, and so that's why you have to have a relationship with your veterinarian and say, what can I give? And if I can't get the dog to swallow something, is there something I can put in the ears? Is there something that you could give me to give them rectally? Is there something I could give by injection? Um, so that's why, I, like, 
Dr. Turen, when she said that uh, they are doing uh, some telehealth help for people, I think that is just phenomenal. Um, but again, she did say you have to have a local veterinarian that you're working with. So if they want something prescribed. Um, <clears throat> now, at Monkey's House, you are very much into integrative care. So food therapy is a huge part of it. Uh, nutraceuticals, really? supplements, <clears throat> nutraceuticals and supplements are huge, but you don't run the other way from medications if they're needed. No. So my, my promise to these dogs when they come here is that it will never be as bad as it was right before they got here. And so if they need big guns, pain meds, if nothing else is working, sometimes it's temporary and it gets you over a hump. And sometimes it buys them comfort as they're passing. Um, I'll, I'll do what it takes, but absolutely having an integrative approach, um, doing as much as you can, keeping them mobile um, with, with the cold laser, with, with exercises. We have a, a, a certified uh, rehab tech that comes out twice a week. They get massages, they do gait strengthening, they do stretching. Um, cold laser, uh, and and it's all for fun. I mean, they all love her. She she pays them in treats, um, <laughs> but it gives them mobility and independence, and it extends that so much longer than what their body was going to give them. So if you've never taken care of yourself and you're going to die young, and all of a sudden you wake up at this health spa, there's work to be done, but it's rare that it's too late. It's rare that it's too late. Um, I, I do understand being afraid of what you're going to encounter as they're dying. And I know as Parker was dying, you said to me very comfortingly, well, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I, think I never sugarcoated <laughs> things with you. And it's, it's funny because I never realized that I was... Um, Direct. That I, that I was that direct with you. Because I was always just like, well, Michelle's tough. This is no problem. And, and then she'd be like, uh, uh. I had a whole, whole hour between your office and getting home where I could cry like a crazy person. But, you know, and what was good was you were okay with me sobbing in your office and you would keep, you would keep talking. And I would say, do I have everything I need? Do I have everything I need to keep him comfortable? And, you know, you know sometimes there's a, a shot if you're working if you're working specifically with with vets that do home-based um, euthanasia they'll give you a crap hits the fan shot that you can give them if you're worried that things have progressed too far but once you give that shot you're committed to going to an emergency room for euthanasia it doesn't get you through to a doesn't get you through the night to a two o'clock in the afternoon appointment it's you know it's just a an emergency shot in um the course that we um completed we went through in great detail, many things, many kits, many, many things. If your dog suddenly goes into respiratory distress, chances are you have a good amount of things around the house to help comfort the dog while you come up with a plan. And I say that now, um, like we're talking here about um, euthanasia versus assisted natural death, but ERs have great waiting times. Some people are being turned away from ERs. So the sooner you can bring the dog comfort, if that respiratory distress can be reversed, the less damage is happening to their body. So, so it's, great. it's great that I have oxygen here. It's great that I have a fan here. It's great that I have a cooling blanket. It's great that I have emergency medications. And it's great that I can reach my vet. All of those things are, are great. But what I've found is that there is longevity in some dogs that are very unstable because we're able to stop these issues very quickly as they're happening, um, like sometimes within 20 minutes or 30 minutes, and less damage happens. And you know, then we follow up. Um, so, so when there's an acute situation, I'm kind of pushing in whatever is sticking out. If they're having troubles breathing, I'm trying to get that under control. I'm not looking for necessarily what is the root cause of this. If I get it under control. Then the next day we're coming in for an x-ray. We're going, we're, we're going to follow up on what's going on. Um, but I think the, the, the fear, 
I think the fear of death, the fear of dying and the fear of the journey on the way to death is intense. And it's not something you have at a lunch table. And, you know, when I, when I think about the name of our course, like it's, it's very direct, it's very what it's about. But I wonder if it would be more awesome if we said how to get 3,000 more wags out of your dog's tail or how to add 50,000 more pictures to your camera roll of life being good for your dog. Um, because that's really what this is about. That is really what this is about. Um, it's, I'm always one to be prepared. I, I'm calmer when I have everything in order. And I think that that is something that stops, that stops me from, uh, helps, helps me keep my emotions in control. I know that one time we had a dog in respiratory distress and I had a fan in the next room and I went to get it and it wasn't there. Jeff had put it up in the attic and his defense, it was February. Um, and at that point, that's when I decided to get an emergency kit that had everything in it that I needed, that, that wherever it was, everyone knew not to touch it. It was the emergency kit. And we've given it a name called Mary Poppins so that no one gets upset when Mary Poppins is in the room. But it has everything I need so that I never have to run up into the attic to get a fan. And I'm not away from the dog that long. And when you're running and looking, your adrenaline is going up and your dog is alone. So if everything is just a, a roller cart away, it's less stressful on you. And again, if the symptoms can be reversed, reversing them as fast as possible is, is going to help them have the best longevity on the other side of it. Yep, absolutely. Okay, well, I think we've given people a lot to think about. Um, Michelle and I put a lot of hours into making the integrative approach to hospice and palliative care for dogs. A lot of it would apply to cats too, just when you look at dosing of things, it's for dogs uh, with medications and supplements and herbs and things that we put in there. Um, but this really came from my 38 years of practice and Michelle's well, all of her years as a nurse in the human medical field, by the way, she was nurse of the year. Um, so that has helped her a lot in this journey with the dogs, but she, over the past eight years, has learned uh, volumes of information from every dog. And every dog or cat that comes into our lives has something to teach us. They're there for a reason. Um, my new guy, Charlie, he's teaching me patience. And I need a lesson in that. So it's okay. It is okay. He's got some OCDs. Um, so anyway, um, but you know, the thing is we, we want our animals to stay with us as long as possible. We don't want to jump the, and, and I get a little upset with the, I'd rather be a week too early than a day too late because I'll take seven more days and I'll take seven more days. Like ML Bob, he didn't eat for 10 days. He was down. His abdomen was so swollen with fluid. And then the next day after his chicken nuggets, after he eat out all that fluid, his belly was skinny except for his big liver. And he was up walking and five more months. Who wouldn't want five more months? And no, chicken nuggets are not prescribed in the course. Uh, <laughs> it's not a prescription. It's not. It's not. You know, what's funny is um, that February, we were taking all of the dogs out for a hike in the woods. Um, we were supposed to go to the shore, but it was too windy. So we switched to a hike in the woods. And I had a bunch of volunteers. We were out with every single dog. And ML Bob was in a wagon just because I didn't want to stress him. He, he still a sick dog. Um, and this group of bikers came by and someone said, hey, I think that's ML Bob. Are you guys monkey's house? And we're in the middle of the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. Like we are, we are nowhere. And ML Bob got recognized. It was, it was kind of, it was kind of neat. Was he was, kind of he neat. was kind of famous. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody says, is Mary Poppins in the course or is this kit list something you could share? It is part of the course. Uh, there are a lot of PDF downloads uh, with lists of emergency kit uh, items. Um, oh my gosh. Where to get different supplements, lists of um, uh, links to other 
information. Um, I mean, just tons of stuff in there. So, uh, and I would like to mention that Monkey's House does have an Amazon wish list. You can choose to uh, have uh, things sent to Monkey's House. Um, and for those of you who buy uh, all provide pet food on their website, they have a donation portal there, and they they uh, very nicely donate a lot of food to Monkey's House every month, um, every week. Every, every week, every week, but they also uh, collect donations of funds for Monkey's House, which is uh, really important. And and uh, frankly, the sales of the course are supporting Monkey's House dogs as well. Fifty percent of uh, all the money from the course goes directly to Monkey's House for the dogs. We're so appreciative of that. Um, it's just it's it, my greatest fear is that when I pass what I know goes with me. And this was an opportunity to share what goes on here. Um, it's, it's, it's a great, happy place. And the dogs are what makes, make it happy. Even, and even when they're dying, you know, you look at them and you think, crap, I thought there was more time. I mean, like I said, I have all the same human feelings that everyone else does. Crap, I thought there was more time. But then you just, swing into action about the things that you're, you've learned to do to make this final day or final days uh, comfortable and easy and gentle. Every single one of them though does involve at least a, a message to my veterinarian, if not a call, if not a, you know, sometimes it's a quick run over to the office, um, but it's, it's important. So um, if someone the regular person with one dog, um, I would say, please, please talk to your veterinarian. Please say, listen, you know, I understand that this is bad, um, but this is not my beliefs. Um, and I would like to try to go longer. And, you know, these are the parameters I come up with so far as to when to stop. Um, you know, would you be willing to help me? I can tell you that I've used emergency rooms several times and I'm always told to use an eyes. I was, I actually needed to see a surgeon one time, a, a veterinary surgeon, and he was booked out and they said, well, if you really need to see him come through the emergency room, the emergency room doctor would not um, grant the consult. They felt the dog should just be euthanized. That caused um, a level of emotion in me that I did care to share <laughs> and changed things around and did get the dog to see the surgeon. But they had a, a big meeting. I said, why? why? They, they said they're, they're not used to people that want to take care of their seniors. They're, they hear about the price and they say the dog is old and they're done. And I say, well, I care about the dog. I, I have to be responsible about what I'm spending, but I'm here for help. So what's wrong with me that you don't want to give it? Don't we all love dogs? Isn't that why we're here? And um, they were like, yeah, yeah, that's why we're here. Um, and I, I just think it's important that uh, people know that there are options. It breaks my heart when people say, I wish I'd known about you last year. I wish I'd known about you two years ago. I wish I knew about you two months ago. Um, and it's, it's just a different way of thinking and a different way of embracing the time that you have left and making it a priority, making it the priority in your life to get your dog to the next, to the next phase of whatever comes next as gently and as most loved as possible. And we all love our dogs and cats. And cats, we do, we, and ducks, and horses. Yeah, uh, all those things, all donkeys. Those. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much, Michelle. I really appreciate you being willing to talk about a tough topic. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that um, you did take that advice all those years ago and that we did look into it and we did learn that we don't always have to jump the gun and you know we control pain control seizures control respiratory distress and then let them stay as long as they want to stay yeah and it's it's been so rewarding and there's pictures the pictures of the dog snuggling the pictures of the dogs enjoying life. There's, like I said, I don't want to say it's beautiful in that we're still losing the dogs, 
but I've seen so much more beauty in life, just in life. In Molly's last night of, of life, where I was holding her outside and she was peeing, it was it was gloomy, it was raining, the leaves were all dead on the ground. And I, I wished for her to leave like in the sunshine and the palm trees. I live in New Jersey, there's no palm trees. But, you know <laughs> I mean? Like I, I had wished for something more glamorous. But I looked down at the ground and the leaves were like brown and tan and gold and yellow. The leaves were beautiful and they were glistening from the rain. Like it, it was pretty. It, it, was, it was not sunshine and palm trees, which I was in my head was beautiful. It was ordinary, but beautiful. And something that I wouldn't have seen had I not been looking for something special for Molly. There's a, there's a lot more to it as they teach us all the time. A lot more to it. Exactly. Well, thank you, Michelle. Um, tomorrow, I do not have a guest, but I will be talking about end of life from a TCVM perspective. So something a little bit different that we're going to talk about. All right, everyone have a wonderful evening and Joey will get us out of here. <laughs>